some announcements first, and um, we can start with what's happening this week, and look at the back of your bulletin if you'd like to join along. Um, today, we of course have Sunday school following our worship services. Monday, tomorrow, we have refit here at 5.30. On Wednesday at 10 o'clock, there's Bible studying, Bible study. 2.30, grab a bag for a food pantry. On Friday, from 11 to 2, there's also food pantry. And on Saturday, July 2nd, um, there's an AA meeting at 7 here. Um, I believe we have a, an announcement for camp coming up, and we'll let Brian Nichols take care of that with us. Good morning, church. Good morning. So as you all uh, may remember, a few weeks ago we had a hot dog sale uh, to defray the cost of summer camp for the larger number of kids that we anticipated going to summer camp this year. So I wanted to take a moment this morning uh, to let you know that we currently have 13 kids registered for summer camp at Spring Heights. We are extremely excited about that number. Um, we also think there's a possibility for even one or two more that just be, may be late registrations. So um, first I wanted to give a big thanks to those parents, aunts, uncles, guardians uh, that have made that happen, made that registration for those kids happen. Uh, it's going to be a great experience for our kids. Summer camp there at Spring Heights is an awesome time. Um, secondly, our hot dog sale was wildly successful. Um, while I'm pretty sure that the hot dogs, the pasta salad, the desserts uh, were all delicious. Uh, your generosity for that effort was overwhelming. Uh, between the hot dog sale and other generous donations, we raised $3,143. Um, so, so through that effort, we were able to fully sponsor three kids going to a beginner's camp, we're also able to give the remaining 10 campers um, half scholarships for the cost of, of uh, camp, as well as several that were full scholarships uh, as needed. And so I just wanted to take a moment this morning and say thank you, thank you, thank you, church. I'm hard pressed to find a better uh, investment that this church could make than investing in its kids. Um, and so now we know that your generosity and appetite for hot dogs uh, was a blessing. So thank you all. Wow, that is truly a blessing. Um, some, of, some more of our announcements um, for food pantry this month. Featured items include spaghetti sauce and hot dog chili. Again, if you'd like to serve in any capacity here at the church, check out the welcome desk. There's a, there's a card where you can let Pastor Jen and, and the office staff know what your interests are. And Vacation Bible School is coming, so don't forget that's July 11th through the 15th. If you haven't yet registered, there's still time to do so. You can do that online, and it will be um, from 6 to 8 with dinner proceeding at 5.30. Also, a special announcement, youth confirmation classes are coming and they will begin on Sunday, August 7th at 6.30. There will be 12 sessions, so if you have um, students that would like to register, please do so. Get to Pastor Jen as soon as possible. Are there any other announcements this morning? Okay. We'll go ahead and move to our concerns for prayer. Does anyone have a concern they'd like to share this morning? Yes, for the Stout family, yes, passing out. Also lifted up, um, continued prayer for Parker Fox and continued treatment. And also for traveling mercies for those um, coming or going this week. And also lifting up our kids at 4-H camp this week. Um, I know from uh, other 
Comparing to other clubs, we have a very young 4-H club here at Quiet Dell, so we have a lot of first-year campers, and this is a really big deal for some of them to be away from home for a week. So think about those guys and hope that they have a safe and, and um, eventful week to make friends and learn new things. And are there any other, uh, how about some joys? 4-H camp, I guess, is a blessing, is a concern and a joy. So <laughs> are there any other joys this morning? Yes. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, that's great. Then visiting from Norway. So yes, traveling mercies for sure. And I'm looking forward to that visit. That's awesome. Are there any other joys this morning? Hey, if there's nothing more, we'll go ahead and join in our call to worship. Please stand as you are able. Oh, This is adapted from the book of Psalm 77. We cry aloud to God that he may hear us. In days of trouble, we seek the Lord. In the night, our hands are stretched out without weary. Our souls refuse to be comforted. We will call to mind the deeds of the Lord. We will remember your wonders of old. We will meditate on all your word and new song mighty deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is so great as our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have displayed your might among the peoples. With your strong arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph, Selah. When the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were very deep trembled. The clouds poured out water, the skies thundered, your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea, your path through the mighty waters, yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. And as we get ready to go to him, I would like to welcome Steve Losh with us this morning, who has joined us um, with Pastor Jen, still um, traveling with family. I'm sorry for not introducing you sooner. We are very happy to have you with us this morning. <laughs> and if we'd like to join in our opening hymn, it's Jesus Calls Us, 398 in your hymnal. Our reading from the Old Testament today is from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 19 to 21. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shephat, who was plowing twelve yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the twelfth pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. 
Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. Word of God for the people of God. Be to God. Good morning, Quiet Dale. All right, it's good to see you here this morning. I want to thank you for, for making the effort to be here this morning. Thank you for being Quiet Dale United Methodist Church on this last Sunday of June. So, uh, uh, for those of you that may not know me, my name is in the bulletin. I've already been introduced, and I thank you for that. But my name is Steve Losh, and uh, I'm the lay leader out of Trinity United Methodist Church, which is right over the ridge on Brushy Fork. So, uh, and I, I want to thank Pastor Jennifer for. Uh, giving me this opportunity to come and speak to you and to share with you uh, worshiping our Lord this morning. All right. Let us bow our head for prayer. Our most gracious and loving Father, you have brought us together this morning. You have led us from this busy world into this sanctuary, and we thank you so very much for this time together and this opportunity to freely worship you as a community of faith. You continually bestow your blessings upon us, and we see your glory each and every day in all that you have created. We are so appreciative that you are mindful of us and planned that which is good for all who walk in your ways. We are blessed and lift up every joy to you, Father, and give you thanks. But we also lift up our concerns, every hurt, every sadness, we know you gladly share and carry our burdens, for you are strong, Father, and you never grow weary. We place with you those on our prayer list, those mentioned here today, and those that we hold quietly within our hearts. May your spirit of life, your spirit of grace rest upon them and upon us, so that the comfort and assurance of what will be will sustain and support us through the trials, the pain, and suffering of what currently is. Only in you, Father, can we have life and have it abundantly. Grant us understanding as we hear and reflect upon your word and message to us this morning. Fortify us to take heed and act upon your call and your desire for our lives, so that in whatever opportunities you present to us, our actions will be pleasing in your sight, and will bear fruit for your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, our next hymn can be found in the United Methodist Hymnal on page 394, Something Beautiful. We're going to sing it twice. Okay, do two times.
Amen. Thank you. All right, if the children would come forward, it's time for our children's moment. I assume they know where they're going. Let's see? All right. an Old Testament prophet that had, uh, had this experience with God. Okay, this is from the book of Amos, chapter 7, verses 7 through 8a. He said, this is what he showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall, and it was built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, he said, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. All right. I just really love it when uh, verses in the Bible utilize surveying objects uh, in, in their reference. Because that's what I, I, well, I graduated from Glenville State College as a land surveyor. And I've been doing that for many, many years, since 1977. So when you get surveying references to the Bible, that's a wonderful thing to me. It makes the lesson extra special. So, what is this? Anybody see that back there? Anybody knows what, anybody knows what that is? Never seen that before, have you? It's called a plumb bob. A plumb bob, okay? And this one is a very special plumb bob. All right, really special. This, what's that? Can it make noise? Well, if I, hit you with, if I hit you with it, there'd be a noise. Yeah, if you drop it on your foot, there'd be a noise. <laughs> but no, but it's a very special plumb bob. It was my first plumb bob that I bought when I was a college student back at Glenville, way back in 1975. Okay, this is your solid brass 18 ounce plumb bob. Okay, really good one, very stable in the wind, very cool. Well, it's very cool if you're a surveyor anyway. Might not be cool to somebody else, but th this, this is the real deal right here. So what does a plumb bob do? What does a plumb bob do? Well, no, when you hold it right here, it tells you where straight up and down is. It's vertical. That shows that, that is true vertical. That is perpendicular to the center of gravity. And that little point right there always points to the center of the earth. Isn't that something? No matter what, you want to hold it and see how heavy it is? Don't, don't drop it on your foot. Just grab the plumb bob. No, not the string. The plumb bob. There you go. Yeah, it's heavy. See, pretty heavy. Okay. Here. You can pass it around. Just don't, don't drop it on anybody's foot. It's got a sharp point. It's heavy. Yeah, it's over a pound. Yeah. But, and the great thing about a plumb bob is, it's very important that you get things plumb. Plumb with straight up and down. That, that's very important when you're surveying land, when you're building a building, when you're doing anything like that. That's a very important thing. You need to know that. Anybody that's a carpenter or does any kind of uh, construction work knows you need to get things plumb, get things square. All right? Everybody get a hold of it? Okay. So the great thing about a plumb bob, too, is that unlike other surveying instruments, they don't need batteries. And that's great. You don't have to charge your plumb bob. Like you do about everything else we have, you got to charge them. The plumb bob works every single time, all the time. It's a wonderful piece of equipment. The only thing you have to do every now and then is fix the string. Right there where the string goes in the plumb bob, sometimes it gets a little frayed. Okay? Well, it can break off if it gets too frayed. Okay? And that's when you will have to fix it, when it gets worn out. Now, that's not the plumb bob's fault, is it? That's just the way strings are. Strings just happen to wear out. So what did God mean when he told Amos that he was setting a plumb line for his people and will never pass them by again? What, what did he mean by that? What do you think? 
Right. Well, if we think of God as being this plumb bob, okay, he's stable. He always works. He's always pointing to what is true and what is right. Yes. And the, right, this points right to the middle of the earth, and God is in the middle of the earth. He's out here on this earth. He's up in heaven. God is everywhere. God is everywhere. But he has given this plumb line. He is always true and right. He is always straight. He was always straight up and down with us, okay? And he has given this plumb line, this knowledge, this guidance, that through his holy word in the Bible, right, through his son Jesus Christ and through his Holy Spirit, that he is always there for us, and he will never, never, ever leave us. That's a good thing, isn't it? Now, we, on the other hand, we're kind of more like the string. That's what we're kind of like in, the, in this whole thing. Things happen to us in life that sometimes they cause us to get a little bit frayed, don't they? We get a little bit weak at points, you know. It weakens our connection to God. It weakens our connection to the plumb bob. And that's just the way we are. We're like that string. To fix that, when we get frayed, that weak part of us, what can we do? What's some things we can do when we start to feel a little frayed? Yeah. We, we can pray some, can't we? We can pray, right? We can read the Bible, study God's Word. We can come to church, right? We can talk with other Christians about what's bothering us, what's wearing us out, causing us to lose that connection. And if we truly want help, God will fix us, and he will reconnect us to him. No matter what happens to you as you grow older, and as young as you are right now, you know, and you've got a long life ahead of you, no matter what happens to you, I want you to always remember that God loves you immensely. He loves you so much, okay? And he is always, always going to be there for you. That's what he tells us in the Bible. It was true then. It's true today, and it's going to be true forever and ever. And you know what? That's the plumb truth. Okay? <laughs> Let's have a word of prayer. Bow our heads. Dear Father, we, we thank you for always being true, always being upright, always being straight, always being there and willing to help when things get tough and we start to wear a little thin. We thank you for our children this opportunity to teach your word to them. It's truly, truly, Father, a wonderful thing. We pray that it will be written on their hearts and be of great benefit to them as they live their young lives. Bless them, Father, to feel your presence and your love. And ask your blessing to fall upon this congregation, this church, Father, as they continue in their efforts to teach your message and display your example of love and family in their community and beyond. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, children. Okay. All right, I was told by the, the pianist there that she does not have the uh, next uh, uh, book that holds the, the, the following hymn, so we will bypass that, uh, that hymn, and we'll go straight to the gospel reading. From the book of Luke, chapter 9, verses 51 through 62. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, and he sent messengers on ahead, who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, Foxes have dens, and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. <clears throat> he said to another man, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. 
Still another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. This is the word of the Lord that comes to the Lord's people this day. And people say, thanks be to God. All right, our scripture text this morning is going to come to us from the book of Luke, chapter 13, verses 6 through 9. Luke 13, verses 6 through 9. Very short parable. Parable of the barren fig tree. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came seeking fruit on it, and he found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and put on fertilizer. Then, if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, then you can cut it down. Now, on the face of that, this parable seems pretty easy to understand, doesn't it? Not too complicated. Here we have this fig tree. Now, if this took place in West Virginia, it could be an apple tree, could be a cherry tree, maybe a peach, a plum, a pear, a persimmon, or maybe, maybe even a pawpaw tree for that matter. But anyhow, it's part of the landowner's orchard. And for the past three years, three years has not produced one single piece of fruit. And that frustrates him. That frustrates him. We can relate to that. Yeah. What good is a fig tree without figs? He's using this orchard to help feed his family and also to grow produce in which to sell to make some money. So a barren tree is of no use to him. Why not cut it down and give something else? Give something else a chance to flourish in that piece of ground. So he says to the vine dresser, cut it down. But what does the vine dresser do? Hmm? Well, he obviously works for the landowner, doesn't he? He's either an employee or a servant, and he's supposed to perform as he's directed. But instead, he says, he doesn't say yes, sir, as you wish. He intercedes on behalf of the fig tree. He becomes the fig tree's advocate. He proposes a regimen to help aid the tree in accomplishing its purpose and thus to extend its life. Now, I don't know if his response is based on his ability to maybe see something in that tree that the owner cannot, or because maybe he's tried this in the past to some degree of success, or because he knows that if it works, if it works, the owner will see fruit faster than if he planted a sapling in its place. Or maybe, maybe, just maybe he's acting out of a faith in and a hope for that tree. Jesus really doesn't give us his motive only that he's willing to try something to give the tree another year to produce. And that's it. That's where the parable ends. Kind of leaves us hanging, doesn't it? Yeah, not, not much else to it. What happened after the vine dresser's recommendation? Did the owner agree to let him try? Or did he not? Well... Well, it seems to me that having the suggestion in the parable to aid the tree insinuates that the owner relented from his cut-it-down directive and allowed the vine dresser to perform his suggestion. Anyway, I think that scenario makes for a much better story and hopefully a much better sermon. <laughs> so, so maybe, well... Think about that. If we take that route then, that he did perform his regimen, that would beckon another question, wouldn't it? After the year was up, did the tree produce? Hmm. Something else for us to ponder. 
So maybe, just maybe that parable is not so simple as it seems. What does it mean? What does it mean? Well, let's start by replacing the fig tree with ourselves. Okay, first of all, we're here on this earth, we're on this piece of ground, and we're alive because of God, our owner. And we have a purpose for being so. What is that purpose? Well, from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And then in Paul's letter to the Galatians, in chapter 5, verse 6, he says this, he says, For in Christ Jesus, the only thing, the only thing that counts for anything is faith working through love. So you see our purpose, our reason for being here is to bring glory to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, to walk in the way of faith through love and do the good works that he has prepared for us to do. In other words, to produce fruit. Or as John the Baptist, when he was down by the River Jordan, he told the Pharisees and the Sadducees, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Now I don't know, nor does the parable say, why the fig tree wasn't producing. Could have been for any number of reasons. And it's the same for us. Why don't we always produce? Well, it could be for any number of reasons, couldn't it? You know yourself. You know your life. You know what's in it. Why do you make the choices and allocate your time and efforts the way you do? What endeavors take priority? And what ones always seem to be placed at the bottom of the pile? Or if you do perform them, done so in a manner and a demeanor that I lack a little bit of enthusiasm. If you look at yourself honestly, it's no big secret. And I'll be the first to admit, I'll be the, I'll be the first one there, that on way too many occasions, my branches have been woefully absent of good fruit. Woefully absent of good fruit. But thank God, thank God I and you have a vine dresser. Amen? We have a vine dresser, Jesus Christ the righteous, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. He is our advocate to the Father, our advocate to the owner, and he's willing to help us and to give us another chance. But there's another message in between the lines of this parable. Okay? It was a common belief among the Jews back then that your condition in life was directly attributed to what you or your family had done. You had a disease. You had an infirmity because of your sinful nature. That's what they believed. All the bad things in your life were tied to a lack of piety. Now, on the contrary, Jews who had, they had nice houses, they had a bounty of possessions and other luxuries, were thought to have received those things as a blessing from God for being such a good person. And many of them would often boast. They would boast as such. They would say, look at me. Look at me. See what I have. Look at all this stuff. I'm really good. I'm really faithful. Now, this thought's still alive today, believe it or not. It's still alive today. It's known as the gospel of prosperity. The gospel of prosperity. And it's a popular theme that is often preached because it makes the prosperous feel that God has blessed them in a special way because they are faithful believers. It keeps them happy, keeps them content, and most importantly, keeps them willing to give to those who tell them as much. But this, this parable, this parable of the barren fig tree, turns this notion upside down. In order to understand the poignancy of the parable, we have to know what a vineyard looks like when one would normally come looking for figs on a tree. Now this is later in the season, okay? 
At this time of the growing season, the grapes would already have been harvested and the vines would have been pruned to the point where they looked like dry, gnarled stubs. Now in the midst of this stands this green fig tree. So to the casual observer that's walking by, it would appear that the tree was very special indeed because the vine dresser had treated it with such loving care. Oh, that, that must be a really nice tree. Look at all he, he's done for it, really taking care of it. That's what one would expect from the gospel of prosperity, isn't it? That good things are a reward for faith and fruitfulness. But the truth here is exactly the opposite. The tree has received its special care because it has yet to produce the fruit that it was meant to bear. Ah, a little different, isn't it? A little different perspective. Makes you think. Could it be that the things that we have acquired, the earthly things that we have accumulated, along with our talents and our spiritual gifts that we've received from God, are synonymous with the loving care given the tree by the vine dresser? That we have these things, not because we've been so good, but because they have a reason and a purpose for us to have. That is, to endow us, to nourish us, to sustain and prompt us to produce good fruit for God. Hmm? And they also could serve as a warning, can't they, about impending doom if we do not respond and begin to produce. Remember the parable of the talents? There were three men that were given a number of talents according to their ability. Now the first two produced. They doubled what they were originally given. And they were praised and they were rewarded by their master. But the third man did not utilize his talent in a productive way. And he was labeled as wicked, slothful, and worthless. And he ended up being cast into the outer darkness where that never good, never good weeping and gnashing of teeth thing takes place. <laughs> Not a good place to be, is it? Don't want to be there. This short parable raises the possibility that our own abundance has been given to us in an effort to lead us to follow the words and the footsteps of Jesus, to share our resources, to share ourselves, and to bear fruit in the works that God has prepared for us to do, to display our faith working through love. From Paul's letter to the Galatians in chapter 6, he says, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. As we alluded to earlier, after the year was up, did the fig tree produce? Hmm? Well, that's something we'll never know. We'll never know. But the beauty in that is we are afforded to write our own ending. Okay? We can write our own ending to this story. The ending of the parable for ourselves. For us here today, for us gathered here today and those watching from wherever they are, the growing season is still in progress. We are still in the growing season. Our vine dresser, our advocate, Jesus Christ, has given us the best of care, hadn't he? And he has placed in our midst all that we need, all that we need in order to fulfill our created purpose. So, will we produce fruit? Or will we be cut down? Will God one day look at us and say, this is my beloved child with whom I am well pleased? That is our ending to right. Thanks be to God, the owner of the vineyard, for his miraculous, miraculous grace towards us that he has decided to give us another chance to extend our lives, not just one more season, 
but for life eternal. Amen? Amen. 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 Let us bow our heads, close our eyes, and just contemplate for a minute. When the light shines on the pages of our story, how will it read? The moments we missed? We missed a chance to change things for the better? The times we stood silently by when someone needed us to step up? The times we spoke or acted in anger and not in love? The times we forgot that the world does not revolve around us. When the light shines on the pages of our story, how will it read? How every moment is a new beginning? How we can radiate hope and love even when the spotlight is not upon us? And how you and I, all of us, are part of each other's story. As we settle in this moment, dear God, gather in us. Amen. All right, our next hymn is on page 396. Oh, Jesus, I have promised. Let us receive the benediction. Be steadfast and productive, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in him your labor is not in vain. Now go in peace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit abide with you now and forever. Amen. Peace.
that was meant to be with God our Creator children all are we let us walk with each other in perfect harmony with every need we take and with thee the moment now with every step I take let this be my solemn vow to take each moment and live each moment in peace Amen.